Uh, then we move to uh, Vishal. And uh, Vishal, I'd like you to provide some perspective uh, that uh, may be controversial, but maybe also be seen in a positive way, that uh, you as an equipment manufacturer, when you get involved in developing projects, spending money to develop projects, you're obviously doing that because you also want to, se to sell your equipment to the project. Uh, how do you ensure that, uh, uh, while you're doing that, that the overall project actually uh, still makes sense from the economics? And uh, how do you reassure the stakeholders that you know, it's still going to be a very competitive project? Um, the, o the only correction I'd make to that is the only reason we do this is to sell equipment. So the only reason yeah. we'll do this is to sell equipment, not, yeah. the, not as an appendage. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious about it. I think that if you look at EPCs and equipment suppliers like us, we'd much rather just provide our services into these projects. Why are we doing this? We're doing this to enable these projects to take it over the finish line. We're not flying in and flying out. We have people on the ground, manufacturing on the ground. We're creating and investing in local economies. And it is our turbines and our equipment that's going to be there long after developers have come and gone. And, and to make sure that we're, we're there and committed and see these projects through is, is, is key to us. Now, I, I heard one of your colleagues in the earlier session express some amount of dismay to be associated with competition. We, as equipment suppliers, live in an extremely competitive market. So competition is not something that is new to us. If you're talking about independence, we're not pretending, guys, to be independent. Right? We're doing this because we're selling equipment. So yes, we're competitive. Talk to our equipment guys. Make sure the economics work. And then if you need development support, intellectual capital, development capital, equity capital, and in some ways, you know, the might of a company like G, the advocacy, you know, getting exits from around the world to line up, getting our banking guys to drive deals, you know, getting the highest level of <coughs> political will in countries around the world to support a project, then we're your partner. We're a reluctant developer on a bad day a co-developer on a good day, and a lead developer on no day. <laughs> and, and we don't pretend, guys. So we're, we're willing to be the lead developer in intellectual capital and development capital, disproportionate to our partners during the development phase. But at financial close, we're happy to be minority because we're selling equipment. So the guys that actually want to sell money into the project, the IFCs of this world, the P guys, the developers of the world, are, we're more than happy for you to take the majority in the boardroom, right? But that's where it starts and stops. I think the narrative in my mind must be focused on getting the projects done, mm -hmm. not be focused on, are you an equipment supplier? Do you, are you competitive, are you not? Because I can't remember how many projects we closed last year as sort of a region. I can't count them on one hand. So I think the narrative really needs to be focused on how do we get this done? And can we all play an enabling role to get it done? Which is what we, we want to be focused on. Uh, thank you, Vishal. I mean, I, certainly uh, I have to say that at IFC Infra Ventures, uh, we are very happy to be in co-development partnerships uh, with uh, EPC contractors or um, equipment suppliers uh, provided that everybody has the same interest in making sure that the project is developed in the most competitive way. We need more developers in the continent, not less. Uh, so I just pose this question so that we can have a debate, maybe the audience will have additional questions around those areas. But I think that uh, we just don't see enough bankable project. So everybody uh, with the right mindset that wants to hold up sleeves, take early stage risk capital, uh, uh, and to roll up the sieve to develop project, I think we will work on them. Uh, certainly there could be some tensions. Uh, we're also happy to provide financing in projects that we are co-developing. Uh, so that's also uh, an issue that uh, people could raise. But ultimately we need to increase the pipeline of bankable project uh, for money uh, because it's quite a bit of money which is ready to finance those projects. Let me just uh, go quickly, um, uh, let me ask a quick question uh, to uh, uh, Angus and, and Carl just on the pure economics of the development business. I mean, this is risky stuff. How much money do you make? Uh, how much return 
uh, could you make on a development stage? Uh, I suppose it's quite a big return because you're taking quite a bit of risk. Maybe you can start, uh, Angus, to, to give us a sense. If they're trade secrets, you don't have to tell us, but give us a sense as to how much money you make in that business. Yeah. Um, maybe just to, to, to clarify, uh, you know, in, in the same way that equipment suppliers uh, are, are really in the business for selling equipment, uh, Neotel itself is, is an operator. So we, we do operate a uh, we have a we have a separate projects division that does our own projects as well as other people's projects, uh, but to a very large extent, the, the the real return for us on on some of the the, the bigger on some of the bigger work that we've done has been um, our involvement in in being an operator ultimately. Um, so if I just look at some of the you know let's take the examples of the submarine cables for example, um, submarine cables are only really worth it uh, when they're operated over a very long term by a tel uh, by a telco. Um, the, the the examples of, of uh, you know individual investors investing in submarine cable and trying to get return purely on the submarine cable. So in other words, you know, build the cable and then sell the capacity to somebody else um, does not have a very good history globally. Um, the, the the best return on submarine cables is is when those assets end up in the hands of telcos that do all kinds of other things with them in the future. Um, that said, I think the the I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about numbers, but I think the, the, the difficulty we have in, in, in Africa generally is um, the, the risk premium that we, we, we're dealing with, which is, I think, made, made worse in a number of cases by lack of clarity and lack of certainty with regard to policy and, and sort of, get, if you like, comfort for, for investors. Um, if I, again, I'm going to look at the example of uh, when, when we uh, got involved in, in the, the two big submarine cables around the continent, on Wax and Easy on the east and west coast. There we were talking with uh, multiple private investors and multiple governments involved. Um, and there's a premium to be paid you know, in, for, for having to land in countries where it's really unclear whether you can ever make your money back. Um, and there are still, and, and I won't name the countries, but there are a number of countries where those cables land today where the individual investors in those countries have not made their money back because the policy environment just does not enable, for example, competitive telecoms. Um, and so I think the, 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 the difficulty is that you, you, you need to add a premium, not just for the ordinary risk factors, but for, you know, if you like, policy and in, in, in telco space, particularly policy and in, in regulatory factors, um, where you find that, you know, at some, some way into the project, uh, suddenly the whole environment has changed. Uh, that's been our experience in South Africa. Two years after we got our license in a duopoly, uh, the market had 100 carriers. Um, that's a fundamentally different uh, market in which to get a return on, on the investment. And I think that's the kind of uncertainty that has raised the, raised the premium on projects okay. in Africa. Thank you very much, uh, um, Andrews. Um, now, uh, Carl, if you can just quickly also give us a sense on the economics. I'd like to go to the audience. Um, I mean, can you just give us, I mean, you must be making a decent money on your business. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know, it depends what decent money is, but um, we generally look for a profit on cost of about 20%, uh, yield on cost of about 15, uh, which with some leverage will give us RRs over 20, and we are uh, achieving uh, better than that. Um, and I think what we would like also is to figure out a way to, to uh, calculate the social return um, of what we do, and, and uh, I think that a lot more work could be done on, on, on capturing that. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, that's, that's not bad. Um, let me uh, go turn to the audience now um, uh, and, and see where the uh, questions uh, for our panelists. Uh, any any question in the, in the audience? Yes, there are two, two questions here. One here and one over there, please. Uh, really, a question for Alain. For me? Yeah. Okay, I'm supposed to well, moderate or don't. No, no. <laughs> yes. No, you ask everybody else how much money they make and how profitable they are. Just tell us. Uh, tell us about InfraVentures. Yeah. Tell us um, 
how you recover your costs, and tell us how many projects you've closed to date. Mm -hmm. You started, what, 2008 or something like that? Mm -hmm. How many have you closed? Uh, how, where do you stand in terms of recovering your costs? Yeah. And are you competitive with the other PE guys? <laughs> and uh, am I competitive? Well, I mean, it's the first time that there are questions for the moderator, but uh, the moderator will take questions. Uh, so can we take uh, additional questions? Uh, not for the moderator. Uh, and then I'll come back to that, please. Good morning, my name is Gert van Seidel. I'm uh, head of a private company in South Africa who are quite involved in the development space. I um, want to comment on, on two or three things briefly and then maybe some suggestion on that. As a developer, the question of a premium after you've developed a project and you get a financial place is a very difficult one. Because investors don't look at your premium, in our opinion, they look at the returns. So if you developed a project and you're sitting at 15% return, you'd probably get no premium. So that's a danger and the risk a project developer sits with. The other thing I want to, to just state is um, equipment suppliers. We think in our environment there's a complete misnomer about competitiveness. If an equipment supplier are prepared to come in with us early, and spend three years to develop a project and this equipment is procured in that process and you get the returns on the project, that should be the guidelines, in our opinion. So if a project is around a 20% IRR and you've locked in and the, in our space we, 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 we are in the energy sector, uh, we develop power projects, small power projects, we get agreement up front with the government or the industry where we sell power we get an agreement up front what is the hurdle rate of IOR and what our returns would be in that and what would be the tariff. And if we fit in with an equipment supplier selected up front, so be it. At least we get the project closed and the tariff is acceptable and the return is acceptable rather than working two, three years and then go and get quotes in the market. Just a small comment. Okay, thank you very much. I think there was, uh, there was some other question on that side. Uh, please. Hi, um, I'm Steve Winter from um, Solar Reserve. Um, actually, just to follow on of the previous question, um, and, and probably with a different slant, actually, um, and, and this again is to the construction companies and, and Bishop as an as a equipment supplier. Um, as a co-developer, I would say there's inherent uh, fiduciary duty on, on the part of the project, so looking internally, to actually get a, a, a market-related and the best uh, be it equipment or EPC contract for, for the project from an internal perspective. And so, you know, with that in mind, I, you know, I fully appreciate that if you're coming on early in terms of development, you, you, you obtain certain rights in that respect. But surely there's a market test, there's a recusal of third party negotiations and contracts, the Chinese walls between the development team and, uh, you know, the equipment supplier or, the, or the, in fact, the EPC. Um, because you know, somewhere within the project, your co-developers um, certainly are also hammering away to try and get the best deal they can. Okay, so thank you. Uh, let's uh, go through that uh, first series of questions. Um, I, I will start with uh, the question that was addressed to me. Um, so, Infraventures, uh, we've signed uh, 36 at uh, 36 uh, joint development agreements on project infrastructure project globally uh, we have today as of today about 21 projects which are still active on the development so uh, there's already uh, quite a few projects that we know we not go through uh, we've lost money on those projects but that's okay and uh, we have closed um, today um, a couple of projects that we've brought to financial close, including a fairly sizable project that we closed in Georgia uh, with our partners here from Tata Power of India, that uh, we started developing the project and we brought them in and we took the project to financial close and the project is under construction. Uh, this is a 185 megawatt project, uh, hydro project on the development. And then in South Sudan Africa, we have closed uh, an IPP in Senegal that we co-developed 
with a Lebanese sponsor uh, called Millet Power Gen, which is owned by Matile Group. Uh, we are fairly close to delivering another couple of projects which are fairly close to financial growth, so to speak, and uh, um, we're working with, on one of these projects. Uh, it was initially developed by an equipment uh, manufacturer, and uh, hopefully I'm telling my colleagues that I'd like to see financial growth fairly soon. They're telling me that uh, maybe we are two, three, maximum four months away from, uh, from financial close. And, and we have uh, a few orders which are close to, to getting there. Uh, the developing business is challenging, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's also very important that um, a number of parties are willing to roll up their sleeve and actually invest in that, uh, in that segment of the market. Uh, now, let me uh, turn to my colleagues from EPC contractors and uh, equipment suppliers to provide further comments after what we've heard uh, about um, uh, the questions on the EPC and, and the equipment supplier getting involved in project development. Uh, Mike, you want to get us started and then Michelle, maybe? Um, <coughs> thanks. As an EPC contractor, we would, um, <laughs> there's a huge amount of criteria and you have to tick off the, uh, <coughs> the uh, list of items that you want to tick off to make sure you want to carry on with the project in the first place and start investing in all this risk capital we've been talking about. And one of those would be obviously the, the equipment supplier. So. Um, if we weren't convinced that we would be getting the best supplier uh, price out of the supplier, we wouldn't want them in the team. And um, but often they are the catalyst to it. So we would, <coughs> through um, discussions beforehand and comparing prices, um, we would just make sure that they are not going to upset the apple cart. Because at the end of the day, when you're finalising that price to make it come in um, with with the overall feasibility, there's pressure on everybody, and, and we certainly have to start cutting here and cutting there and cutting uh, profits or overheads or whatever it is. And we also look to the supplier to, to do the same. Sometimes they're rigid, sometimes they're not. Um, but it's that supplier that you choose in the first place that you've got to have confidence in. So we think it can be managed. Okay, Vishal, you want to make one comment on that or you want to? Um, no, to, to the right of the room, I, I thank you. To the left of the room, I agree. <laughs> I, look, I think um, building an a, um, independence process in terms of the deal team is really critical uh, because that's what creates sustainable projects. It's not enough to take a project to financial close. Bad things happen between financial close and, and COD date. We all know that. There's no point in constructing something in a forced manner that doesn't make sense economically because inevitably there's a haircut waiting for you between financial close and COD. I think we all know that. So, so that's really important to us. Um, the development part of the organization, such as the one that I lead, I can't tell the difference between our F engines and our G engines. We don't make those. I'm being facetious. What we're trying to do is we're a deal team, and our job is to be enablers, right? So it's a pure development team that's there to essentially make deals happen. And we're not involved in any... Uh, customer service kind of agreement bits, we're not involved in any pricing dialogue, and it, we don't bring any value to those discussions. Right? So I think, it, and if we, like I said, if we don't get to financial close and more importantly COD, then we just failed in our job. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so we, we're, gonna, we're gonna have closing comments uh, because we're running late. And so I'm going to ask, uh, uh, there is a burning question, Barbara, I don't know uh, if we can take that one. Uh, burning um, but quick. Okay, burning but quick, sir. Um, sorry, just a quick one. And, uh, we're waiting for your hurdle rates and uh, your return. Okay, so uh, another question to the moderator. <laughs> this is not good to be a moderator today. Um, so, uh, uh, so, um, uh, our hurdle rate is basically uh, what the market will bear. Uh, <laughs> so, so we are co we are co developers. But what I want to make sure is that uh, in the market we are taken seriously as a commercial co developer, although we are a DFI entity, entity. So we want to make the same money as you guys make as developer, and we're taking the same risk as you guys are taking as co developers. Uh, so, so that's that's the. Uh, and I see my, my friend Sean, I told that to Sean many times, uh, who was uh, from Endeavor. Um, so um, let, let me just uh, quickly, you guys, uh, uh, closing statements. I'd like you in closing 
to really address uh, quickly, uh, one of the questions we came, which came up in the previous panel, one of the panelists said, all the project, <laughs> ideally, all the project, infrastructure project in Africa should be subject to a competitive bidding process. So what is your <coughs> sense about that? What, uh, is, it, is it a good idea also to have sole source of uh, unsolicited uh, uh, deals? Uh, in, in making those closing comments, can you address that question, please? <coughs> Right, we, um, we would prefer the traditional tendering rate where, we, where our risk is only delivery and the price we pre pre present and we don't have to get tied up with the risk of, of the developer or the project sustainability, etc. But that um, requires the government to have money and uh, that doesn't always happen, so clearly we get um, pulled into developing it ourselves. And, um, yeah, I think... Um, you know, there's a, between that and, and being a developer, there's a whole range of risks and, and um, issues that one has to undertake. But I think you've got to be flexible and uh, quick on your feet and, and, and adapt to the requirements of the particular country and the particular project to make your decisions. Okay, Carl. Um, I think uh, different situations call for different things. In certain situations, it may make sense to go with, uh, with one person that you or one company that already worked well with. In other situations, it's 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 better to tender. Um, I think we uh, we try to take things a lot more in house, work a lot more closely with guys because as developers, we have the risk at the end of the day on the delivery uh, of the of the people that we that we work with. Um, I would say though, I had one statement that that I quite disagree with, with, which that you know government should do all developments of all projects and. Uh, well, I'd like to see that happen because not a lot would happen. Oh, thank you, Carl. Gilberto? Well, I would say there is a, an ideal world and a real world. In the ideal world, of course, everything should be under a competitive basis and uh, going for tender and so on. And we, as Montegil Africa, are quite aggressive on that. But there is a, there is a real world. Africa is growing quite rapidly. The, the GDP of the SADC region growing above 6%. Um, the number of opportunities coming from the private sector becoming more and more and more demanding of kind of this um, developing of projects. Um, there are a number of, of, of um, conditions that governments cannot fulfill because of all kind of shortages. So we have to face it as we should, we should as, we, as we are doing it. If there are an opportunity for an unsolicited bid, between the moment that we express our intention until the moment that we do financial closure, it will pass through all the stages and all kinds of scrutinities. And I am very, very convinced mm -hmm. that when we get a financial closure under a project derived from an unsolicited bid, the end, it will not be different of a, a, any other competitive price. Because we, is that the other side of the table, is also looking at the figures and also making his own calculations. So, and above that, when we interact with uh, the FIs and the, um, the, 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 the high level of investment, the level of compliance, the Chinese walls are so, so demanding that you must be really accurate on your pricing or otherwise will be out of the market. And if we are talking about the road, for instance, a PPP, like when we have got in, in Mozambique, the government of Mozambique knows how much costs one kilometer of road. So they know how much will cost one kilometer of road under the PPP. So they know the cost of financing and they know the cost of maintenance. So those, those, those ratios are there. So it's, it's impossible to do something completely out of the reality. But as I said, there is an ideal world and a real world. And I, which I, I, I shall emphasize that we are in a real world. Thank you so much. Okay, maybe we can go to uh, Angus first and then Michelle, you could you finish. Yeah. In, in the telecoms world, I think we, we tend towards the, the uh, open tender model where we can, but I suspect our suppliers see it differently. Um, but there, there's no doubt that there's an increasingly um, a need for, for, for risk to pass to suppliers as well. Um, telco projects are often <coughs> quite a lot smaller than some of the really big infrastructure projects. Um, there's a lot of smaller stuff that gets, gets done and Increasingly, we are seeing that it's, it's quite challenging to run uh, <coughs> projects on, on, on a pure open tender basis because it's, it's incredibly competitive. Um, 
and you, you actually really do need ultimately partners who can take some, some risk with you. Um, that said, I think all the, the market right now is, is not where everybody would like it to be. The opportunities are, are not necessarily there, but I think the specifically in, in telecoms infrastructure, I think we've, we've passed the wave of mobile infrastructure, and I think the, the next wave of, of true broadband fiber infrastructure, et cetera, in, in Africa is coming, and I think that's where the opportunities are going to come back. All right. Thank you, Andres. And Michel, would you please uh, share your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think that we should continue to focus the narrative on getting deals done, and, and that should be the focus. Enabling and getting deals done should be the primary narrative, building a sustainable pipeline, and, and building out the developer market in region is really important. So I see Sean and Allah from Endeavor sitting in the room, you know, platforms and developers like Endeavor, local conglomerates from Transcorp to Transcentury that actually say I want to do work in the region, become developers in the region, are really important to the future of all those economies. Every head of state that ever meets a G senior executive says, when are you going to set up manufacturing in my country? Well, the answer is, when are we going to see some big orders? Right? It's, it's simple. So in order for us to set up substantial manufacturing in country to create jobs and supplier, uh, supply chains, to have developers like yourselves standing up and playing a role in that is really critical to us. And we're willing to be your partner and play a role in that. The, the issues around, you know, can we sell more equipment? Are we being in some way selfish by creating a customer in you? Well, yes, of course, that's what we're doing. But, but we're also hopefully have line interest in getting these deals done, getting them over the finish line, creating more jobs and putting manufacturing on your doorstep. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and, and let's give a round of applause to the panel. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.